I'm just going to get started. It's an amazing turnout. <laughs> so, my name is Drew Branch, um, and welcome to Need More Sleep, Rest and Help. Like I said, my name is Drew Branch. Um, I'm an associate security analyst at ISC. I have an electrical and computer engineering degree from Morgan State. I also hold a master in cybersecurity from UNBC. A couple of my hobbies are learning about new tech and also breaking it as well as playing sports. I'm very competitive, I love to win, hate to lose. If you're on my team, chances are you're gonna win. So a little bit about ISC. We are based out of Baltimore. We perform high-end custom security assessments. We don't just run security uh, tool scans and deliver generated reports to our clients. Um, I get to assess new technologies, which is amazing. Um, part of that is RESTful APIs. That's what Base room. So I want to give you guys a little bit of background about RESTful APIs. Uh, in, uh, also comparison um, in preparing REST versus SOAP. Um, also give you guys a little bit of information about REST concepts. And we'll go, also go into common security mistakes as well as how to fix those mistakes. So a little bit of background, uh, REST stands for Representational State Transfer. So when dealing with RESTful APIs, you are not receiving the actual data from the server. You're, you're receiving a representation of that data from the server to the client. Um, REST is a stateless client-server cacheable communication protocol. Um, there are similarities between REST and HTTP because void fielding um, is that define uh, REST is also one of the main uh, contributors of HTTP. REST use, um, well, REST makes use of HTTP methods for all CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete. So REST versus SOAP. There is no guideline that states if your API has this, then it's REST. There are no, I guess, okay, so fine so rules. Like, if you obey this rule, then it's REST. If you don't, it's not REST. It's easier to create documentation for RESTful APIs. It's scalable. And REST APIs make use of all HTTP methods. HTTP methods. SOAP, on the other hand, uses the SOAP protocol to exchange data. It's bound by the SOAP specification. So if you don't abide by one rule, then your SOAP API or the API that you thought was SOAP is not a SOAP API. And SOAP APIs always use the POST method for all operations. So let's take a, let's take a look at a couple example, example requests here. On the left, we have a, re a REST request. It's using the POST method to authenticate the user, We're sending um, the username, which is admin, and the password, which is admin, to the server. On the right, we have a SOAP request, which also uses the POST method, but within the body, um, it contains the actual um, operation that should be carried out. So here you can see that we're using the POST method, but in reality, we are getting the stock price uh, for IBM. Uh, SOAP requests always contain complex XML. Um, but on the other hand, REST can contain any type of data format, such as JSON or XML, whatever the back end is allowed to accept. So let's go over a couple HTTP methods. We have GET, which is used to retrieve a resource from the back end, POST, which is used to create a new resource. Delete, which is uh, used to delete a resource at a specified uh, URL. Patch and put. Uh, patch is used to modify a resource, but to not replace it. Uh, for patch requests, the request must contain a uh, patch body that is specific to the patch specification. Put um, replaces the resource with newly updated content 
for that resource, but it can also be used to create a resource. Other methods include options, head, and trace. These are just a few. There are much more out there, but these are the most common ones. Some status codes. Here I listed a couple status codes um, which you may encounter when testing or developing RESTful APIs. Here we have 200 level status codes which pretty much says, hey, your request went through, except it was a success, and everything is good to go. So we have 200 which is okay, 201 which is treated, 202 which is accepted. And we also have 400 which are client um, errors. So we have 400 which says, hey, Client send the server a bad request. 401 unauthorized. 403 forbidden. And 404, which everyone has seen the 404 status code before, which is not found. I also have here 500, which is a server error level status codes, and 500 is just internal server error. Something happening on the server. We don't know what. Hopefully, we don't know what. Uh, but if we do, uh, the server disclose some information that it shouldn't have. I should also mention that there are 100 level status codes, which are informational, as well as 300 level, which is used for redirection. So data format. You might be asking the question, what is the data format for RESTful APIs? But there are no rules on data format. So the next question is, how does the client or the server know what data format the data that it's receiving in. And that is by the content type header. Uh, usually in RESTful APIs, um, the client or server usually receives and sends data in XML or JSON. Um, again, there's no rules on the actual data format, so it could also be in plain text. It can be in any format you want it to be in. It should also be noted that um, an API can return multiple data types. So when you create a RESTful API, you're not bound to just one data type. So content negotiation. When the client connects to the server, it says, hey, I want data in this format because I support that format. So to do that, the client sends a step header, which contains all the data formats that the client accepts. When the um, server receives that data um, header, a step header, I'm sorry, the server either sends the data in that format or sends an error saying, hey, I do not accept or send data in this format. Please try again. So if the client says, hey, I want my data in XML, the server says, hey, I can send it in XML, or it can return the error. So let's talk a little bit about resource URIs. There are two types. We have static and we also have RESTful URIs. The static URI is something like this, example.com slash blog name, where each blog name or where, where, where each blog has a static web page. A RESTful example would be example.com slash blog slash blog ID, where you are using the blog ID to request the blog from the server. The URI in the RESTful example stays the same even if the application has changed, as well as being independent of the framework. So it is better to group resources that belong to other resources in a subfolder instead of in its own folder. Um, it's simpler, it makes it easier for the client to develop um, client software. And it also makes it clear that a resource belongs to a particular resource. So let's take a look at two examples. In the first one we have example.com slash comments slash common ID. So here we are accessing one comment uh, within the comments folder. This is treating the blogs and its comments as separate entities. It loses the relationship between a blog and its comments. In the second example, we have example.com slash blogs slash blog ID slash comments slash comment ID. 
So here we are accessing the comments of a particular blog. Now this example keeps the relationship. It's better to organize resources and this method instead of like having the blogs in one directory and then the comments in another directory. So let's touch on a concept um, known as HATOS. It stands for Hypermedia as the Engine of Application State. This is a concept where the server sends resource URIs to the client so the client does not have to deal with uh, URI construction. Let's take an example. Let's look at an example. Here's a sample response from the server containing URIs to the blog's comments as well as the author's profile. Here you can see the blog has an ID of one, the author is the brand, which is me, the data was created, and underneath we have the comments URI, which is API slash blog slash one slash comments, as well as the profile of the author, which is API slash profile slash one. I'm the only author of the blog service. So, you might be asking when you're developing a RESTful API, is my API RESTful? Is it fully RESTful? Is it almost RESTful? Or not at all? The answer to this question um, is we use to, we use to classify RESTful APIs is the Richardson maturity model. Let's take a look at it. So there are pretty much three levels of this model. Um, level zero is, hey, your, your API isn't restful at all. It's pretty much just an um, API. Level one is the use of resources. Um, each resource has an individual URI, and you are accessing each resource by its ID. But the request will still contain the operation to be carried out, such as the a uh, SOAP uh, request. So say you're still using the POST method, you will have to somewhere in your data say, hey, I want to either get a resource, create a resource, or um, to update a resource. Level two comes in where in, oh. Level two comes in when you start to use HTTP methods, like the appropriate methods for the operation. Say you want to get a resource, so you use the get method. If you want to delete a resource, you use the delete method. And also status codes. So the server will return status codes to the client. Level three comes in when you start to implement um, hypermedia controls, HTTPs. Now, these are general guidelines. Um, there are no rules for REST, so this is just a, a, a loosely um, written guideline to guide people in the fabrication of RESTful APIs. So testing RESTful APIs. There's a couple of tools that are great. We have Postman, which is amazing for um, API testing during development, as well as Burp Suite, um, which is used, well I use it, um, to assess APIs during an actual assessment. So let's take a look at the GUI of Postman. So to the left, um, you can see we have the history of all the requests that we previously sent. Um, Postman also gives the tester the ability to send different types of requests. So here we have get, post, put, patch, delete. Any type of request we want to send, we can send from Postman as well as um, edit the headers and the body of each request. Here's the GUI for Burp Suite. Um, it has a lot of different tools uh, for testing RESTful APIs. I will be using the repeater functionality, but it also has an interceptor, spider, um, automated scanner if you have the pro version, um, intruder, uh, which is used to fuzz um, things such as login forms and other um, security uh, assessment methodologies. 
So when creating and assessing RESTful API, there are a couple concerns. You are concerned about unauthenticated, unauthorized modification of protected assets, as well as unauthenticated, unauthorized access to protected assets, as well as replay attacks. So for this talk, I created a sample blog API, RESTful API, using Eclipse, Spring, and Tomcat. Um, Eclipse make it easy to download and install dependencies via Maven. Maven is a project management utility, so it'll pretty much import all the dependencies that your project needs automatically. You won't have to worry about downloading and adding it to your path. So let's take a look at the first concept, which is to protect HTTP methods. Not every method is valid for every resource or endpoint. Um, you should whitelist allowable methods. For example, um, a user should not be able to delete a login form. So the delete method should not be allowable for that endpoint. So here's what it looks like in Spring. So I have an endpoint blocks, which accepts the get method. And for this endpoint, it's just requesting all the blocks that is in the database. So here's what it looks like in Jersey. Um, so Spring and Jersey are RESTful web services frameworks. Jersey is an extension of JAX-RS, which is a Java API for RESTful web services. So I'll be using these two to show you guys examples of how to um, protect your RESTful API. So here we annotated the endpoint with a Git annotation here. So here this endpoint will only accept Git requests. Okay, let's talk a little bit about JSON Web Tokens, or JOTs. I am coming across these more and more during assessments. Um, people are straying away from the usual cookies um, and using JSON Web Tokens. JSON Web Tokens are used to verify the sender. They're self-contained, so they're stateless. They contain all the information needed for the server to authenticate the user, so the server does not have to store any data regarding the session. They are in JSON format. They're only base64 encoded. So if you see the, the client or the server returning or sending a base64 blob of whatever, it's most likely a JSON web token. JSON web tokens um, also cannot be secured by HTTP cookie flags, such as secure and HTTP only because they're not cookies. These tokens are sent um, within an authorization header, um, but they're not used specifically to authorize somebody. They're, they're not used to authenticate the user, but they also can be used for authorization. So I'll show you guys an example of that later. So here's the usual um, flow of a JSON web token. The user sends an authentication request, post request to the server. The server then verifies the username and password and then creates the JSON web token. It returns the token to the client and then the client sends that token with an each request to the server. The server checks that JSON web token to uh, make sure that it's still valid and it will either say, hey, this JSON web token expired, you need to re-authenticate, or send the requested resource or media. So there are three parts of JSON web tokens. There is the header, the payload, and the signature. The header contains the algorithm used to create the signature, and also the token type, which is usually JSON web token. The payload contains 
claims. Um, so it's usually the user name of some sort to identify the user and also metadata about the token, such as expiration date, the issuer, and the uh, subject, which is the username. So here's a sample JSON web token. Here we have the header, which contains the algorithm used, which is HMAC SHA-256, and the type of token it is, JSON web token. To the right we have the payload, so the issuer is the brand, which is myself, the subject is username, which is any username, um, and the expiration date is uh, included as well. To compute the signature of a JSON web token, the base64 of the header plus the dot and the base64 of the payload is HMAC SHA-256, in this case, that's the algorithm you use to create the signature, and that's how you uh, create signatures for a JSON web token. So the HMAC SHA can be any algorithm used. Um, so this is just one example. So below we have the format of JSON web token. So you have the header dot payload dot signature. This is just one example. Uh, these tokens are much longer, and I will show you guys an example of that a couple slides. So JSON web token should not contain any sensitive information because it's only base64 encoded, it's not encrypted. Although uh, developers have the option to encrypt uh, JSON web tokens using uh, JSON web encryption, JWE. The secret used to create signatures should be kept secured on the server side. If somebody gains access to the secret, they can forge their own JSON web tokens and pretty much can access whatever they want on the server. So securing endpoints with JSON web tokens, um, the service should always verify signatures, set short expiration dates. So if an adversary were to get a hold of a JSON web token, um, they only have a limited time to use that token. Always communicate over a secure channel, HTTPS, because we cannot um, secure JSON web tokens with flags such as secure or HTTP only. These tokens must be secured using a um, secure communication channel. And uh, secure your signing secret server side. Do not um, include sensitive data in JSON web tokens. If so, please encrypt your data. Okay, so here I am sending a request to the server. I'm not authenticated. I am not sending a JSON web token with my request. So I am sending a GET request to the blocks endpoint, which then is returning all the blocks. Now, this should not happen. As a tester, you're like, yes. Um, as a developer, you're like, what did I do wrong? This shouldn't be happening. Um, so let's take a look at what the code um, should look like. So for each request, a filter, well, this is it's an example in Spring. So I created a filter which intercepts all requests and then checks the token, um, the JSON web token for validity. Um, as well as um, the username. So what this filter does is it extracts the token from the request, it validates the token as well as the user, and it either passes the request through or returns an error. So let's take a look at the valid the token uh, method. So here we are extracting the token from the request, we are checking the username to, um, to ensure that the user name that's in a token is a valid user of the, of the service or system. We are checking the expiration date of the token, as well as checking to see if the token was created after the last password reset. So now we have our filter implemented. Let's see if we can send it, if we can send the same request again. So we're sending a get request to the blocks endpoint, and we are returned with a 401 error. You're not authorized, which is great. This is exactly what we wanted. 
Um, we did not send a valid or a JSON web token with our request, so we received an error. Now let's send the same request with a spoof JSON web token. So same request, and we just include a false JSON web token, and we receive the same error, unauthorized. So exactly what we wanted. So we should protect sensitive resources. So the, uh, the developer should implement access controls, whether it's role-based or user-based. I'm seeing more and more during assessments that developers or, or companies are using multi-tenant environments. So in these environments, um, every user or tenant should not have access to someone else's resource. And we should protect those with role or user level access controls or workspace access controls. So resource creation. Uh, resource IDs are created in succession. So let's say one client uploads a resource and has an ID of 300. Say I'm in a different workspace or a different um, environment and I upload a resource, most likely it's going to be, the ID of my resource is going to be 301. So it's easy to enumerate resource IDs. So if you don't have any protections in place, um, adversaries, but then enumerate resource IDs and access um, someone else's resources. So here, I'm sending an off request to the server. The server then checks my username and password and returns the token, a valid token. I'm going to be using this token to request blocks from my API. Here we have three different blocks um, with IDs 1, 2, and 3. Um, we have authors, the brand, admin, and user. Now, I am logged in as a I'm logged in as the user, which is an ordinary user level account. I shouldn't have any special privileges or permissions. So let's try to delete block two, which is the admin's block. So I send a delete request, block slash block two, and I receive a 200 level status code, 200. Okay, your, your block has been deleted and returns the block that has been deleted. As you can see, it's ID2 and the author is admin. Now this shouldn't happen because I am not an admin, I'm just a, a regular user and I am not the author of this block. So let's take a look at the code. Let's check out what it looks like. So here we have an endpoint blog slash blog ID, which pretty much takes the ID and retrieves the blog. This endpoint only accepts the delete request. So here, send a delete method. This endpoint then retrieves the blog and then removes the blog. It doesn't do any checking or access controls, anything. It just retrieves the blog and deletes the blog. So any user can delete any uh, body's blog, which should happen. So here's what the code should look like. Here, we are extracting the JSON web token. We already verified it through our filter and everything checks out. Then we are extracting the username from the token as well as the permissions of that user. So here, I have an if statement that says if the author of the blog is the same as the author in, within the uh, JSON web token to delete the blog. Or if this user within the JSON web token has role of admin, you can also delete the block. If not, then the error will be sent back to the client saying you are not authorized to perform this action. So let's send the same request um, using the same user level account to delete block two, which is the admin's block. And I receive you are not authorized to perform this action, which is great, it's exactly what we wanted. Another um, issue is input validation. 
the server should always validate the input from the client, um, which is using the client type. So, say I request, say I receive a request that contains the content type XML, but the header says, "Hey, I'm receiving something other than XML." The server should return an error. So we can annotate our endpoints with um, the consumes annotation, saying, hey, this endpoint should only accept JSON or XML or whatever the data that you want this endpoint to um, accept. So this is an example in Spring. Here we have the blobs endpoint, and we want to consume only JSON. And this is what it looks like in Jersey. Same thing, annotation of consumes and application JSON. So let's test this out. So here, I have content type slash uh, text slash XML, which is pretty much saying, hey, my data is an XML. But remember, my endpoint only allows JSON. So we should return an error in this case, in which it does. It's 415 unsupported media type saying it can't read the data because it's not in JSON, essentially. Okay, let's change our content type header to application slash JSON, but still send XML data. Um, we receive a 400 level status um, error saying, hey, this is a bad request. I'm expecting a curly brace, essentially, and I don't see a curly brace, so I can't read this data. It's not in my preferred format. Output encoding. So your RESTful API should always send security headers. Um, in this case, content type and also content type options or S content type options. So the content type should always match the data within the request. So if your server is sending JSON, the content type header should also say my data is in JSON, which is application slash JSON. The RESTful API should also send the X content header, X content type options header, no sniff, so that the client or browsers will not attempt to detect other data formats than the server is actually sending. So wrapping up, um, you always want to annotate your endpoints with allowable methods. As a developer, you want to follow JSON Web Token's best practices. You always want to implement access controls when you're protecting resources. Protect sensitive resources from information disclosure or unauthorized access, which is extremely important. Always want to validate import and also send correct content type headers with your data. So my blog API is available on GitHub, and this presentation is available on my company's website, which is here. Um, does anybody have any questions? How are you going to inspire you to some web tools? Okay, so there is, let me see what happened in here. If you go to my, um, my blog API on GitHub, you will, you will see that you can set a date. So say the time is based off uh, the universal time, G, GMT time from what, 1970, I believe is, is the start of it. So you will use that time, that's, you will use the current time, and then you will also append how long you want the uh, token to be valid for. So the time will be in seconds. So you would say this many seconds from this time, this token is valid. Okay, and let's say, for example, that I, uh, I'm authenticating a mobile, uh, mobile app mm -hmm. and uh, the person loses the phone or, or it gets in the wrong hands, for example. Mm -hmm. How would I prevent access? Uh, let's say that it's still locked in, for example. How would I uh, prevent access to that specific uh, token? Um, that is within the expiration date. 
Yeah, yeah. So there, there are two um, options here. So one is the expiration. So if an adversary gets the device and the token is still valid, they can um, access the resources. But also, um, in my example, I also um, check the token's um, creation date with the last password reset date to ensure that the token was created after the password reset date. So the user can reset his or her password and then that previously created token, no matter if it's still valid via the um, time, will not be valid server size. And then you grab all that information and you combine it with text mining. Any more questions? Do you usually report potential cross-site scripting on, on these APIs? I'm saying potential because the response is JSON. Yeah. So do you, do you usually report that uh, to a customer or you don't? Or what's your experience with that? Yeah, yeah, you should definitely um, report that. Um, it depends on the actual severity. So if it's exploitable, then definitely. Um, we use um, strategic weakness to say, hey, this is an issue. It's not necessarily exploitable, but mm -hmm. you guys should correct this issue. And what's your experience with the customer response to that? <laughs> <laughs> um, both good and bad. Um, some love the feedback, and then some are just like, ah, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? That point. Um, with the content type being wrong, normally it's like, oh, well, so what, right? Text plain, text HTML, whatever, but that actually is the safeguard. No, I was just curious about the experience because I know I don't know what, what's my experience with that. <laughs> what is your experience? With that? Uh, usually, customers say that it's not a, it's not an issue because it's not exploitable. Yeah. Well, sometimes it is exploitable. If you can send mm -hmm. something and cause JSON to come back with HTML inside, mm -hmm. then like less than or them are not going to be escaped mm -hmm. because they're not JavaScript characters. So it is exploitable. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.